I am super stoked to introduce John Verveke. So for those of you in, uh, in the know of the modern Stoic movement or our Stoic super users, you might not be familiar with John's work, but he's creating a lot of buzz right now in something that's called the, the sense-making community in web. Uh, he released a series recently called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And uh, this series is absolutely amazing. I highly recommend you check it out. And it's all surrounding something called, that he coined called the meaning crisis. Uh, I think Viktor Frankl, he may have called it the, an existential vacuum. This widespread sense of, uh, of lack of meaning in our lives. So to formally introduce John. Uh, John is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, uh, where he currently teaches courses in the psychology department on thinking and reasoning with an emphasis on insight problem solving, cognitive development with an emphasis on di di dynamic nature of development and higher cognitive processes with an emphasis on intelligence, rationality, mindfulness, and the psychology of wisdom. He also teaches courses in the Cognitive Science Program, uh, as well as in Buddhism, Psychology, and Mental Health Program. Uh, he's the director of the Consciousness and Wisdom Study Laboratory. I didn't know that there was a Wisdom Studies Laboratory, but <laughs> that sounds pretty awesome. Uh, he has won and been nominated for several teaching awards, and he has published articles on relevance, realization, general intelligence, mindfulness, flow, metaphor, and wisdom. He's the author of the book, Zombies uh, in Western Culture, A 21st Century Crisis, uh, which is an awesome book, by the way. Uh, in, in that book, he integrates psychology and cognitive science to address what he calls the meaning crisis in Western society. So in this talk, uh, he's going to argue that the spiritual exercise of the view from above, which is a Stoic uh, exercise, addresses a central problem faced by those cultivating a Stoic way of life how to bring about the transformational experience and aspirational development so necessary to realizing a rational way of life, even though such transformative, uh, transformative experiences and aspirational changes of identity cannot be driven in an inferential manner. Uh, the talk will explore cognitive machinery involved in the exercise and explain how the exercise activates that machinery in the service of the transformation and perspectival and participatory knowing, and thereby deepening understanding, overcoming absurdity, and provoking transcendence. So essentially, buckle up, uh, <laughs> and uh, please give a warm applause for John Ravakey. Thanks, Peter. As Peter said, I want to talk to you about a particular exercise. I'll, I'll briefly describe it. I know that uh, Donald Robertson is going to take you through the exercise, so I'll do, be doing a lot of the theory and some of the cognitive science, and then we'll do the exercise together. So you get sort of the one-two punch. What I'm particularly interested in is how this exercise contributes to rationality, but what I'm going to have to do is try and sort of broaden your notion of what rationality is. That's part of what the project is. So the view from above, just very quickly, is the imaginative exercise where you imagine sort of rising above the earth and seeing it sort of from uh, extended elevations, and you can also extend it in time, a broader historical scope. Imagine that you're, you've been alive for a thousand years as opposed to, well, for me, 56. All right. And then one of the things you can immediately think about is that this action, this spiritual exercise of imaginatively rising above the earth in this way and getting a view from above is opening up that space, opening up the space between impression and response. Now here's what I want to do. I want to reverse engineer the exercise with you. That's what I do as a cognitive scientist. I try to figure out cognition by reverse engineering it. What does that mean? Find a problem that your cognition needs to solve and then try to engineer what a solution would look like and then figure out if your cognition is approximating that solution. That's what it is to reverse engineer. That's how we're going about making the terrifying artificial intelligence that is soon going to make all of us completely irrelevant. <laughs> Bit of a joke. <laughs> okay, so what I want to do is set the problem with you. And as I'm setting the problem, I'm going to try to introduce these ideas to you that we should broaden. In order to broaden the notion of rationality, we need to broaden the kinds of knowing we're going to talk about. We're very familiar with propositional knowing, but I want to talk about procedural and especially perspectival and participatory knowing. You don't know what that means right now. That's why I'm here. That's, that's, what, that's what I'm doing for you. Okay. 
And I want to talk about a kind of rationality that uh, Agnes Collard calls proleptic rationality and how it's actually right, instantiated in the view from above as a practice. Then I want to talk to you about the cognitive science of the view from above. What's cognitive science saying about this practice? Because it's actually telling us a lot about it's, what it's doing to our cognition and our consciousness. And then I want to confront a problem. Because the view from the above can look an awful lot like the view from nowhere that Thomas Nagel famously talked about. And the thing about the view from nowhere is it provokes cosmic absurdity and a sense of meaninglessness. And you know it's going to take away any joy in life from you? A pervasive sense of meaninglessness. So how do we make sure the view from above doesn't become the view from nowhere? And then I'm going to try and propose a solution to that, making use of some ideas from Spinoza and some current philosophy. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So Stoicism you're, is trying to bring about a radical transformation. You're trying to radically transform yourself. You're trying to get into perhaps a new mode of being. That's how Eric Fromm thought about it when he talked about the having mode and the being mode. Or as uh, you're trying to get into a new way of life. That's the way Pierre Adot famously talked about uh, Stoicism. So it's not just about changing your beliefs. This is a much more comprehensive transformation that is being pointed to because right, we're trying to change who we are, the lives we are living, and the kind of arena in which we are performing our actions. So this is what's known as qualitative development. This is a term taken from psychology, from the, the founder of developmental psychology, because we're talking about development here. We're talking about changing ourselves, transforming ourselves. So Piaget distinguished between two kinds of change, quantitative change, this is where I just get more, I, I acquire more knowledge, I acquire more information. But there's qualitative change. Qualitative change is not changing how much you know, it's changing what you're capable of knowing. Those are two different things. So let me give you an example. You have a five-year-old child, right, and that child is just a sponge, right? I've, had, I've raised two sons and like, I know what this is like. They're just taking in so much information. That's quantitative development. Because although they can take in tons of information, they will fall prey to a bunch of errors repeatedly. They lack a certain competence. So you can do this with them. Take, well, you, you can. I wouldn't, it, it must be horrible growing up with a dad who's a cognitive scientist, right? <laughs> so you, you, you count out five candies, space them like this, one, two, three, four, five, and the four-year-old can count. And they know that six is more than five and five is more than four. Do you understand? You count out five candies, one, two, three, four, five. You count out five more candies in front of them, but you space them like this, one, two, three, four, five. Do you see the difference? And you ask them, which row do you want? And you know what they all reliably pick? The bottom row. Now, how many of you would fall prey to that? Because I've got some investments for you. <laughs> OK? OK, so you don't fall prey for that. They all do, systematically, because they are over fixated on one feature. It is super salient. Salience means to stand out, right? They're fixated on the, the space taken up. They don't pay attention to another variable, which is how much of that space is candy space, which presumably you do. So they have to go through a qualitative development. They have to acquire a new ability, an ability to manage multiple variables in concert with each other. That's a change not in just what you know, it's a change in your competence. It's a, a change in what you're capable of knowing, what co problems you're, you're capable of solving. So stoicism, I, I, I recommend to you is pushing for such a change in competence. Now an interesting thing about exactly that model of qualitative change, it is at the center of an important article written in 1999 by McGee and Barber. McGee and Barber did something very important. They took, they canvassed all the philosophical theories of wisdom and see how much wisdom was in the previous talk. And then they canvassed all the emerging psychological theories of wisdom. And by the way, there are a lot of these. And I, 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 recently I participated in uh, the, the Toronto Wisdom Task Force. It sounds Orwellian, right? It was a six-hour symposium on psychologists and cognitive scientists trying to figure out what wisdom is. McGee and Barber canvassed both of these and they made a convergence argument. What is the central feature that all of these different theories presuppose at the core of wisdom? Here, here is what it is. Seeing through illusion. 
seeing through illusion. Now myself and Leo Ferraro in 2013 argued that's a little bit elliptical because real and illusory are comparative terms. You only know if something's illusory in comparison to something that's more real. So we broadened it, right? Seeing through illusion and into reality. Now that's really important because what they're talking about here is a comprehensive kind of insight. What do I mean by comprehensive? So let's go back to the child. The child isn't only making a conservation area with count, uh, error for counting candies. They'll make it with pouring liquids. From they make a whole family of related errors. That's what it is to be in a particular stage. So you've all had an insight experience, eh? Where you realize, oh, I've misframed the problem and you have that aha experience, yes? But notice what the child has to do though. The child can't just have a single aha here in this problem. The child has to figure out there's a whole family of related problems and have a systematic comprehensive insight. Does that make sense? So that here and here, and, so that's why you don't fall prey to any of these illusions anymore. You've had a very systematic comprehensive insight. That's what it is to see through illusion and into reality. To have a fundamental change so that you gain a competence so that a whole family of problems, you can now see through them. Your, your, your way of seeing doesn't get distorted. Okay, but you say, well, th those are little kids. I'm an adult. Well, first of all, let me remind you of one of Hadot's formulations of wisdom. Right? In fact, and it was shared by all the great schools of antiquity, including Stoicism. As the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. Just like you have gone through qualitative development, so you don't fall prey to the illusions of a child, you as an adult need to go through huge qualitative development to become like a sage and not fall prey to the kinds of systematic illusions we fall prey to. What are examples of these? Well, this is something I study. I study illusion under the idea of self-deception. Self-deception is the fact that the very machinery that makes us adaptive for pro solving problems in the world is the same machinery that makes us self-deceptive. So, why? You can't pay attention to all the information available to you. You can't consider all the options when you're considering a course of action. You cannot calculate all the probabilities. Even our most powerful computers can't do that. So what do you have to do? You have to bias your attention to what's salient and relevant to you. And that's, how, that's what makes you intelligent. In fact, I've argued and published that that's the core ability that makes you intelligent. Your ability to zero in on relevant information. Treat stu some stuff as relevant and some stuff as irrelevant. Here's the problem. That very ability to zero in on relevant information that makes you so adaptive also biases your attention in a maladaptive way. You say, what do you mean? Here's an example. You can't check all the evidence. So you tend to check the evidence that's relevant to you. Relevant to you tends to be serving your interests, yes? So you know what you tend to look for? Evidence that only confirms your beliefs or what you want to be true. This is called the confirmation bias, and what our society has wonderfully done is taken this confirmation bias and put it on methamphetamine, and that's called the social media. <laughs> All right. So, you have many of these kinds of biases. So do I. I'm not free from this. I'm just speaking from a theoretical position, right? We're constantly misframing our experience, and that misframing is self-serving in a powerful way. Now, I want to use this to introduce to you something that we therefore need to pay attention. If rationality is going to be fundamentally about affording this transformation, it's going to require systematic abilities to overcome self-deception. But that means we need to pay attention to how we're framing and how things are self-serving, relevant to us. Now this means we get into two aspects of our knowing that we don't typically pay very much attention to, but I, which I study a lot as a cognitive scientist and cognitive psychologist. So you're all aware of propositional knowing. Propositional knowing is to know that something is the case, and it's about asserting a proposition. A cat is a mammal. 
That's a, that's a proposition. And what I get from propositional knowing is beliefs. And our, cult our culture is just addicted to beliefs, that everything is about belief. Everything is about belief. Belief, 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 belief. Right? But the thing is that, and, 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 so, and we think of truth as some correspondence between the, the semantic content of the proposition and the world. But your knowing that something is the case, and we saw that in the, in the, talk, in the previous talk, is dependent on knowing how to do things, knowing how to select what's relevant, knowing how to pay attention, knowing how to ignore what's irrelevant, knowing how to apply this rule, how not to apply that. What does it mean to be kind? It means one thing with my younger son, Spencer, another thing with my wonderful partner, Sarah, another thing with my students, another thing with a stranger. If I treat them all the same, that's a disaster. All of your propositions depend on your procedural knowing, your knowing how to do things. Knowing how. It's not in beliefs, but in skills. If you're going to cultivate a skill, you need to have what you have right here, right now. You need to have a situational awareness. What's going on in, here now? Here now, this is your perspectival knowing, knowing what it's like to be here right now. It's to have a salience landscape. I'm standing out for you. Your left big toe was not very salient to you until I said that. And what's salient and what's standing out and what you're focusing on is relevant and what you're ignoring is irrelevant, like the back of the room. That's all happening in a highly textured, dynamic fashion right now. And this perspectival knowing really matters because we're having to study it when people are going into virtual reality because it only feels real when things are present to them, when that perspectival landscaping is working properly. And it really matters, for example, when you're doing work like uh, remote scientific work on, on Mars with rovers. So this perspectival knowing, you're doing it right now, the here now togetherness of all of this. That's not ultimately is dependent on your participatory knowing. Because all the time, and you can see stoicism going right to the heart of this, you are doing this in a coordinated fashion. You're assuming an identity and assigning identities. I am the lecturer, you are the audience. That thing is a chair and you sit on it. There's an agent arena relationship that is constantly going on in the basement, the foundations of your cognition. This process of co-identification. That's your participatory knowing. Who am I? Who are you? What is that? And they're co-defining. Look, this is graspable to me. The, grasp of, the fact that it's graspable is not a property of this. It's not graspable by a snail. It's not a feature just of my hand. It's how my hand and this thing co-identify and fit together. And then that makes me aware of it in, in a situational awareness. And then I can cultivate skills of how to use it. And once I can use it, then I can make propositions about it. This is a glass. We tend to stick at the level of our propositions. And things like the view from above are designed to drive you down into these deeper levels of knowing the perspectival and the participatory knowing, where the guts of your identity and the texture of your world is being shaped and made on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. You're doing it right now. So we're trying to bring about a fundamental transformation at that level. What's the problem then? Well, here's the problem. Transformation doesn't make any sense at least initially, philosophically. So here I'm going to draw a convergence argument from three really important thinkers. L.A. Paul in her book from 2014. She literally wrote the book on transformative experience. It's called Transformative Experience. I got to, I, I've got to work, uh, meet and work with Laurie. She's great. Um, Jerry Fodor, founding figure of cognitive science from 1980. A fixation of belief in conceptual analysis. And then a really good book by Agnes Callard from 2018 called Aspiration. The Agency of Becoming. Okay. So let's do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with, with uh, sorry, I'll probably fall into calling L.A. Paul Laurie because I know her. But, so L.A. Paul's, she starts with a, a thought experiment to get you aware of the issue. 
So this is a thought experiment. It's designed to be outlandish, so it will trigger your intuitions appropriately. So your friends come to you, and they give you incontrovertible evidence that they can reliably, without fail, do the following. Turn you into a vampire. Should you do it? How would you decide? Think about it. Here's the problem. I don't know what the perspective of a vampire is until I become one. I don't know what it's going to be like to have the salience landscape of a vampire. I don't know what kind of self I'm going to be, because once I become a vampire, my preferences, my values, everything's going to change. So I am completely ignorant, perspectively and participatory. I don't have, I can't, right? And the only way I can get that perspectival and participatory knowing is if I go through the change. But it's an irreversible change. What do I do? Well, I don't do it, but here's the problem. The ignorance is symmetrical. If I don't do it, I don't know what I'm missing. I literally don't know what I'm missing. Now, I have all kinds of propositions about vampires, but I've just shown you propositional knowledge isn't the same thing as perspectival and participatory. I don't know what it's going to be like to be a vampire. Well, then I won't do it. Well, then you don't know what you're missing. But if I do do it, I don't know what I'm going to lose. I don't know what I'm going to lose. So what do I do? And you say, that's ridiculous. I don't care about being a vampire. Well, she's a philosopher, so she gets you this, and you sort of go, yeah, I get that. And then she goes, and you face these decisions all the time. Here's one. Have a child. <laughs> I've been through it. You don't, your friends can utter propositions to you. Blah, 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 blah. But all the parents are going, yep, get that. <laughs> totally get that. You don't know what you're losing until you get there, but you don't know what you're missing if you, if you never have a child. Fall in love with this person. You're going to be a different person, living in a different world, different perspectival, different participatory knowing. Should you do it? You don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're going to lose. You can't, and here's the key point that Lori makes, you can't infer your way through this because you don't know the probabilities and you don't have a stable set of values throughout. Our standard model of how we make decisions, weigh the probabilities, assign the, uh, assign the values, doesn't apply because we don't know the probabilities because we're deeply ignorant and we know that the values are not stable across the transformation. So you can't infer your way through it. You can't propositional inference your way through this. Now that tells us something because the word rationality has been invoked a lot, but when we hear rationality and you go on YouTube, you have people saying, rationality is syllogistic reasoning, syllogistic, oh, blah, 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 blah. that rationality is reduced to propositional argumentation. That's a fundamental mistake because if that's all rationality is, it doesn't touch perspectival and participatory knowing and it doesn't help you go through transformation. Jerry Fodor gives a similar argument. Right? He basically says, well, he thought that all of cognition is computation, just inferentially manipulating propositions and altering beliefs. That, that's all it is to think. And then he famously said, okay, if Piaget is, well, if, you know, if we take Piaget at his word, people are going through a change in competence. What does that mean? Well, that means a change from a weaker logic to a stronger logic. That's what it is. If I'm changing my competence and all I am is computational, I have to be making a stronger logic from a weaker logic. But you know what you can't do? You can't infer a stronger logic from a weaker logic. I can't do that because I have to add, this is a, for Godelian reasons, I have to step outside my axioms and my functions and introduce new axioms and functions. So he came to this bizarre conclusion. He said, therefore, Piaget is wrong. There's no such thing as development. It's, it's all totally innate from the beginning. Everything a child ever is capable of doing, they have there from the beginning. And everybody else went, what? But, but you can turn it around. It's a modus tollens. The way of getting out of that ridiculousness is to say, that's because most of your cognition, contrary to what we believe, is not computational in nature. Because we have machines that can do exactly what Fodor said we couldn't do. They're neural networks that use dynamical systems and use self-organization to get you through, through this change. 
So how can you be rational? How can you aspire to rationality if rationality can't make use of reasoning? So that takes me to an, an, a final note by, by Agnes Callard. She talks about, in her book, Aspiration, this process of you, where you genuinely undertake the goal of acquiring a value, as, right? And notice how a value combines your skill, what you find salient, and a change in your identity. Proposition, procedural, perspectival, and propositional knowing. So she gives the example of somebody who wants to acquire, they do not currently like classical music, but they want to, they want to like classical music. Now what can motivate them? Not a love of classical music, because you know what they don't have right now? A love of classical music. So what do they do? What are they, well, they take a music appreciation class and they go through these exercises that are designed to transform them. And notice what this word appreciation brings with it. It brings with it the notion Right? Almost of a sensibility transformation, tr transforming, again, your salience landscape, what you find salient, what you find relevant. But also transforming your identity, who and what you are. Changing your understanding. Appreciation also carries with it that. And understanding, unlike knowing, the difference between understanding and knowing is, to know is to be able to assert with evidence a proposition. Understanding is to grasp its significance or relevance. Now, why is all this important to Collard? Well, she says, notice what we have to say here. People are going through these, these processes of gaining an appreciation and transforming themselves, and they can't infer their way through it for all the reasons I've already articulated. So what do they do? Like I said, well, they're doing all these practices, and they're sort of playing with their salience landscape and playing with their identity. Now, if we say, because that's not an argumentative process, it's not rational, we're in deep trouble because of this. One of the things as a Stoic I'm doing is aspiring to be more rational. And if the process of aspiration is itself not a rational process because it's not an argumentative process, you know what I can't do? I can't justify cultivating rationality to you. I can, if you say, no, that process of aspiration is not a rational process because it's not argumentation, then you know what's not rational? The aspiration to become rational. I can't ever justify or persuade you to become rational. And that's the disaster for rationality. So we have to include this aspirational process in our model of rationality. She calls this proleptic rationality. Proleptic rationality. Okay, now, what we should ask ourselves, well, I do because I'm a cognitive scientist and a psychologist, yeah, that's a lot, not a lot of sort of nice abstract hand-waving. How do you do it? How do you go through aspiration? How do you engage in proleptic rationality? Well, there's a couple things you should note. First of all, we need to be triggering a systematic insight, a capacity for systematic insight. Is there a cognitive style that we have experimental evidence will bring about systematic insight? Not just at the propositional level, but how my salience landscape is taking shape and how my sense of self is being transformed. Yes, there is such a cognitive style. It's mindfulness practice. That's why I do research on it. And you're worried here now. He's sneaking in Buddhism. I can feel it. Well, pay attention to the science. We have a lot of good work that all of these principles are efficacious. They are basically put in place by cognitive behavioral therapy, which is probably the most evidence-based effective therapy that we have right now. But you know what's happening? Its effectiveness is actually declining. Why? Because we have gotten focused on propositional techniques and the alteration of belief, and we've lost a lot of the intuitive skill that the original 
right, the originators of CBT had. We've lost the contact with the perspectival and the participatory knowing transformation. So what's the evidence showing? You know what works better than CBT on its own? Giving people CBT and training them in mindfulness. That's what the evidence is clearly indicating. So notice what mindfulness is. It's an attention. It's not an inference practice. It's an attentional practice. You shut off inference, in fact. And what you're doing is using attention to alter your salience landscape and alter your sense of self in a profound and engaged manner. So we need that right away. What else, though? Well, let's go back to L.A. Paul's example. People want to have a kid. What do they do? Well, they don't just sit there going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Some, you know, people just fall into Darwinian impulse. I get that. But let's say people who are doing it as a decision, not as an impulse. Because you should decide, right? What do they do? Well, I, 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 I sort of looked around, and I noticed people doing this sort of bizarre thing. They get a dog. They get a dog, and they'll have family pictures of them and the dog. I was like, whoa. Or I'm thinking about getting in a romantic relationship with this person. And just go on a trip with them. Oh. And I, what's going on there? What's going on is this really interesting thing. And it's actually the key to development. Because this is how children primarily go through those changes we were talking about. This is enacted play. Enact, it's serious play. Like when we use the word play when we're talking about playing music. It's enacted play. And you say, well, adults don't do that. Oh, you better not say that. Because one of the things that's growing right now, for example, in Norwegian countries, countries that are really facing the bite of kind of a, 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 a very successful in many ways secularism, and I'm not dissing that, but there's, there's a bit of a backlash to that success. This meaning crisis that if you, if, you t if you ask me a single question about this right now, I'll be talking for seven hours. So I'm not going to go into the meaning crisis. Right. Watch my series, please. Okay, anyways. Um, what they do, they, they, have, they have live action role playing. You know role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, but in live action you act it out. Right. They have a thing called Jeep form. So Jeep form is instead of a dungeon master and you're rolling dice, you're acting out, there's a, you're, right, you're acting out a scene and there's a, the dungeon master is like a director and the director will set up the scene cut the scene, get you to switch roles, suddenly give you this and say, this is a gun, what are you going to do with it? Stuff like that. And you have to act it out. And here's what you're after when you do this. You're, right, so you're, you're acting out some situation. You're after the phenomena bleed. You're trying to get so that what's happening in the act, the play, bleeds over to a real problem in your real life where you're considering going through a huge transformation. You're trying to play, like the, right? You're trying to play with a new participatory identity. You're trying to play, what does it feel like? What's it like to have that perspective? What is it like to be that person? But I'm not fully committed yet. You engage in inactive, serious play. So now I can give you what I think the view from above is doing. We need something that's attentional, that's altering our sense of salience, our sense of self, getting into the perspectival and the participatory knowing. It's going to manipulate perspective and our sense of self. That's what the view from, the, that's what the view from above is doing. It is going to alter what we consider significant or relevant. That's what the view from above is doing. It's a form of serious enacted play. That's what the view from above is doing. And it's rational, even though it doesn't involve inference, proposition, or argumentation. So what do we know from the cognitive science? Lots. So there's a whole theory called construal level theory. Listen to the word, construal, construal. Your perspective and your participatory knowing. As you get people to move through different levels of construal, so instead of thinking of your problem right here, right now, imagine that your problem is 10 years in the future. That's a reconstruel. 
It's imagination. What do we know about construal level theories? As we get people to move to a higher level of construal, as we get them to move to a view from above, the, everything I'm going to say to you has experimental evidence for it. Right? It, makes ta it makes challenging tasks seem easier. Reliable result. Generates, notice this, self-insight. People get insight into their sense of who and what they are. That co-identification process becomes more apparent to them. They become aware of the identity they, they are assuming and the identities they are assigning. <coughs> Reliably. They gain self-control. Because as you change what is salient to you and your sense of self, your ability to alter your behavior significantly improves. If you try to change your behavior and you're not doing things that give you skills and identities for altering your salience and your sense of self, your ability, this is what the research shows, your ability to change your behavior fails. That's why 95% of people fail on diets. 95%. They have all the right propositions. They don't do anything to alter their competence for salience landscaping or their sense of self. That's why they fail. You become more capable of being authentic. You're less easily pushed around by social influences. Precisely because you've lifted yourself out of that usually unchallenged arena of behavior. Makes you more creative. It generates systematic insight. As I said, there's also research from what's called the overview effect. I'm doing work on this right now. The overview effect is astronauts go up into space and they look back at the Earth and they, they experience awe and wonder. And they say it's the most life-transforming thing that ever happened to them. And you can now, Gallagher and I have actually set up, set up a mixed reality, sort of part of its real, part of its virtual reality. And we can generate the overview effect in people and study this experimentally, generate awe and wonder. And Yadin in 2016 did a nice overview. When you do this with people, what, what does awe do? Awe forces you to open up. Wonder is, and, and awe are different from curiosity. Notice how you want curiosity alleviated, but you would like to perpetuate awe. Because right? curiosity is about quantitative development, getting more information. I need a bit more information. But wonder is about qualitative. It's about opening up and putting your world and yourself into question. That's what awe does. It, it makes you more humble. It, it changes your sense of self and your sense of perspective. Literally, the view from above has all of these measurable effects. Another one. Notice three different lines of research, and they're all converging on the efficacy of this spiritual exercise. So I get to work with my friend and colleague, uh, Igor Grossman, and he's been doing a bunch of work. He started with Gross and Grossman in 2011. He's done a bunch of things. It's called the Solomon Effect. Here's what you do. Give me some horrible problem that you're facing right now. And people describe their problem. Right now. And what should you do? I don't know. I don't know. Then you do this. Stop. I want you to re-describe your problem as if from a third-person perspective. A view from above. What reliably happens is people get systematic insight into their problem and they become more capable, and this is the language used by Igor, of wise reasoning. Before they start, before, they are doing lots of propositional stuff while they're in their problem, and they're reasoning and reasoning and reasoning and reasoning, and they're going nowhere. And then they do the view from above, and they get, oh, and they restructure what they find salient and relevant. They alter their identity, because they're doing it from a third-person perspective, and they get a powerful insight, systematic insight, and then their reasoning becomes efficacious. The reasoning comes after the transformation. Finally, 
And this goes with the awe and wonder. There's the work of Fredrickson, the broaden and build model. These kinds of what are called epistemic emotions like awe and wonder, they broaden your attention, they transform your salience landscaping, they build your skills. That's why we have these emotions. So that's what they're there for. So, four lines of evidence as to why the view from above would be efficacious and therefore how it's efficacious and how it addresses the problem of how to go through transformation when we can't reason our way through it. It's a spiritual exercise. It's different from discourse. That's why Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, especially Epictetus, stop thinking that philosophy is just about the discourse. Stop doing that. That's not Stoicism. But here's the problem. Right? Thomas Nagel, in two places, uh, he did it first in an article in 1971 called The Absurd, and then later in a book called The View From Nowhere, brought up this problem. Because you know what I can do? I can do the view from above, and I go into sort of above the Earth, and then maybe the solar system, and then the galaxy, and then you know what I can do? I can move to a perspective that is isometric with the entire universe, and that's the view from nowhere. And you know what people experience when they get to the view from nowhere? They don't go, wow, this is great. They go, oh, it's all meaninglessness. It's absurd. This is called cosmic absurdity. Now why? Well, let's get into what everyday absurdity is so that we can understand cosmic absurdity. So Nagel gives this wonderful example. Now notice when he wrote, 71 and 80. So this is in the dark time before Star Trek cell phones, right? Where like you, your phone was in a place and you left it there and you had to return to your phone at different times, right? And then you put a recording machine, but you remember these dark days? Okay, so because here's the example. So here's Tom, and Tom has been working himself up all day to call Susan. So he calls Susan, and he's all ready. He hears the phone be picked up, click, and he goes, Susan, don't say anything, I just gotta tell you. I, I, I love you, I love you, I really care about you, I love you. And then he hears, beep, Susan is not here right now. Please leave a message. And you sort of laugh, but there's a bit of pathos. You go, oh, poor Tom. Now notice, first of all, that there's humor there. And what's humor? Humor is about a clash of perspective that gets resolved with play. So absurdity is when we have a, a clash of perspectives that we can't resolve with play. Because what's happening with Tom? Tom has this one perspective, this one silence landscape in which, all, and he's got this particular agency. He is Susan's future lover, and his identity is taking shape, and this silence landscape is there. And then this other perspective a third person, impersonal perspective, slams into his perspective, the perspective of the machine. And those two perspectives don't jive. There's perspectival clash. When you go to the view from nowhere, and then you compare it to your life right here, right now, you experience the greatest perspectival clash you'll ever experience. That's cosmic absurdity. Now notice something that Nagel points out. He points out that many of the arguments people use for absurdity are technically invalid arguments. You don't reason your way into absurdity. I can't do all of it, I'll just give you one example of an argument. People say, well, what I do won't matter 10,000 years from now. It's all meaningless. And Nagel points out, well, be logical. That's, that's a symmetrical thing. If what you do doesn't matter to ten, people 10,000 years from now, you know what's also equally true? What they think 10,000 years from now shouldn't matter to you now. It's equally symmetrical. It's not a valid argument. But you don't go, oh, well, now I feel better. The point is the arguments do not generate the absurdity, they are after the fact expressions of it. What's generating the absurdity is a perspectival clash. How do we deal with the perspectival clash? And because if we know how to deal with the perspectival clash, we know what to do, right? 
We know what to do to keep the view from above from becoming the view from nowhere. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold up a sign and you have to read it as quickly as possible. You okay with that? Yes? Yes or no? Okay, here we go, read it. Out loud. Okay, great. I do this all the time. This is a classic experiment, by the way. This is part of the cognitive scientist dog and pony show. Okay, so first of all, notice what you did. You read this as an H and this as an? Okay, so now I'm gonna reason this for you. I'm gonna do it almost like in a pseudo-Zen thing. And I, I, you know, I, I don't mean any insult to Zen. It's pseudo-Zen, right? right? In order to read the words, I must first read the letters. But in order to dis disambiguate the letters, I must read the words. Therefore, reading is impossible. <laughs> and what you just did was an illusion. Because you don't reason your way through this. You make use of a dynamical self-organizing system. You are simultaneously reading from the features, the letters to the word, and reading from the word down to the features. And you're doing it in parallel in a dynamically self-organizing fashion. That's actually how your attention works. Notice that your attention is simultaneously fusing your sense of self and your sense of object together. That's what your attention is doing right now. I'm, pers I'm attending to the graspability of this cup. My, my identity and the cup's identity are being fused together. That's what your attention is doing right now. Your t attention is a dynamically self-organizing process. So, Spinoza talks about this in the ethics. And when you read the ethics, you have to do the ethics. Don't just read it propositionally, argumentatively. He's trying to actually give you a spiritual exercise that will transform and bring you into a state he calls blessedness. <coughs> he talks about a state you can ar arrive at called sciencia intuitiva. What it is like is this. And, and when you study the ethics, you can have this experience. I've had it. You, so you keep trying to hold the whole argument in your mind, and, blah, 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 and, you, keep, and you, keep, you have to practice and practice, and there's, it's like stretching, and it's like learning a martial art. But you get to this place where this happens. You see the whole argument at once, and you see how it goes into each premise, and how each premise fits into the whole argument. Very much like how the letters go into the words, and the words feed back down into the letters at the same time. And the whole argument is from under the eye of eternity. It's a God's eye point of view. And the individual premises are individual thoughts you have. And so your individual perspective and the cosmic perspective become completely interpenetrating in a self-organizing manner. You see, the problem with cosmic absurdity is all we do is juxtapose the two perspectives against each other and then say, ah! But you know what you can do? You can go through a transformative self-organizing form of play in which they become interpenetrating with each other, sciencia intuitiva, and I would argue that's exactly the goal that's sought after, non-duality in Buddhism, in which the cosmic perspective and the individual perspective are completely interpenetrating, because if they're interpenetrating like this, you know what, you don't suffer? Absurdity. And then you say, but absurdity is about the, oh no, it's not about the arguments, is it? I don't need an argumentative response to absurdity because the arguments aren't driving it. This is what I need. So we can practice the view from above, but we can move towards sciencia intuitiva and thereby always preserve the efficacy of the view from above and never fall into the cosmic absurdity of the view from nowhere. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We also have a, a two-punch right now solution where Donald Robinson is actually going to give an example of the view from above. Uh, so let's invite Donald up here. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So make yourselves comfortable. I'm just going to go straight into this exercise. The only preamble I'm going to give is that if you haven't already switched off your mobile phones, this is probably a good time to do that. 
So we're going to do the view from above exercise. And actually, one thing I'll add is, earlier you saw the photograph of the meeting at Exeter University that was the beginning of the modern stoicism organization. And actually, the thing that triggered that was that I made an audio recording of this exercise over a decade ago and put it online. And it was when students at Exeter listened to the audio exercise that they were kind of inspired to begin organizing the first Stoic Week. So it's this specific exercise that actually started Stoicon and Stoic Week and everything that followed on from that. Take a moment to settle into your posture and make yourself comfortable. Close your eyes and relax. Be aware of your breathing. Notice the rhythm of the breath. Do nothing for a while. Just be content to contemplate your breathing more deeply. Now begin by paying attention to the whole of your body as one, from the top of your head all the way down into your fingers and down into your toes. Be aware of your body as one, every nerve, muscle and fiber. Don't try to change anything. Don't try to stop anything from changing. And some things can change just by being observed. Be content to notice whatever you notice and feel whatever you feel. Be a passive, detached observer. As you continue to relax, turn your attention deeper within. Become more aware of your body. And imagine how you would appear right now if you could just take a step back and look at yourself. Begin to picture yourself as if seen from the outside. And it really doesn't matter how vividly you can see yourself. It's just the intention, the idea that matters. Imagine your body posture, your facial expression, the color and style of your clothing. Now keep looking at the image of yourself resting there. And imagine leaving the ground as you gaze down at your body. You begin floating serenely upwards, slowly and continuously rising upwards. All the while your gaze keeps returning to your body, which remains there below you as you rise above it. Keep looking down toward your body as you float higher and higher and higher. The roof and ceiling can disappear, allowing you to float freely upward. Looking down, you see yourself relaxing comfortably below in the building. You appear contemplative and contented. You can see all the rooms and all the people around you. As you continue to float gently higher and higher, your perspective widens more and more until you see the whole surrounding area. You see all the buildings nearby from above. You see the people in the buildings and in the streets and roads. You observe people far below working or walking along the sidewalk, people cycling or driving their cars, and those traveling on buses and streetcars and trains. You begin to contemplate the whole network of human lives and how people everywhere are interacting with each other, influencing each other, encountering each other in different ways. Floating higher, people become as small as ants below. Rising up into the clouds, you see the whole of the surrounding region beneath you. You see both towns and countryside, and eventually the coastline begins coming into view. 
as your perspective becomes more and more expansive. You float gently up above the clouds and through the upper atmosphere of the planet Earth, so high that you eventually rise beyond the sphere of the planet itself and into outer space. You look toward planet Earth and see it suspended in space before you, silently turning, resplendent in all its majesty and beauty. You see the whole planet, the blue of the great oceans, and the brown and green of the continental land masses. You see the white of the polar ice caps, north and south. You see the grey wisps of cloud that pass silently across the surface of the earth. Though you can no longer see yourself from so far above, you know and feel that you're down there on earth below, and that your life is important. What you do with your life is important. Your change in perspective may even begin to change your view of things, your values and opinions. You contemplate all the countless living beings upon the Earth. The population of the planet is over 7 billion people. You realise that your life is one among many, one person among the whole human race. You think of the rich diversity of human life on Earth, the many languages spoken by people of different races in different countries, people of all different ages, newborn infants, elderly people, people in the prime of life. You think of the enormous variety of human experiences. Some individuals right now are unhappy, whereas some are happy. And you realise how richly varied the tapestry of human life before you actually is. And yet as you gaze upon the planet Earth, you're also aware of its position within the rest of the universe. A tiny speck of stardust adrift in the immeasurable vastness of cosmic space. This world of ours is merely a single planet, a tiny grain of sand by comparison with the endless tracks of cosmic space, a tiny rock in space revolving around our sun. The sun itself just one of countless billions of stars which punctuate the velvet blackness of our galaxy. You think about the present moment on Earth and see it within the broader context of your life as a whole. You think of your lifespan in its totality. You think of your own life as one moment in the enormous lifespan of mankind. Hundreds of generations have lived and died before you. Many more will live and die in the future, long after you yourself are gone. Civilizations too have a lifespan. You think of the great many cities which have arisen and been destroyed throughout the ages. And your own civilization as one in a series, perhaps in the future to be followed by new cities, peoples, languages, cultures, and whole new ways of life. You think of the lifespan of humanity itself, just one of countless billions of species living on the planet. Mankind arose roughly 200,000 years ago. Animal life itself first appeared on Earth over 4 billion years ago. Contemplate time as follows. Realise that if the history of life on Earth filled an encyclopedia a thousand pages long, the life of the entire human race could be represented by a single sentence somewhere in that book. Just one sentence. And now think of the lifespan of the planet itself. Countless billions of years old. The life of the planet Earth too has a beginning, middle and end. Formed from the debris of an exploding star unimaginably long ago. One day in the distant future, its destiny is to be swallowed up and consumed by the fires of our own sun. You think of the great lifespan of the universe itself. The almost incomprehensible vastness of universal time. Starting with a cosmic explosion, a big bang 
immeasurable ages ago in the past. Perhaps one day, at the end of time, this whole universe will implode in itself and disappear once again. Contemplating the vast lifespan of the universe, remember that the present moment is but the briefest of instants, the mere blink of an eye, the turn of a screw, a fleeting second in the mighty river of cosmic time. Yet the here and now is important, standing at the center point of all human experience. Here and now, you find yourself in the midst of living time. Though your body may be small in the grand scheme of things, your imagination, the human imagination, is as big as the universe, bigger than the universe, enveloping everything that can be conceived. You contemplate all things, past, present, and future. You see your life within the bigger picture, the total context of cosmic time and space. You see yourself as an integral part of something much bigger, something truly vast, the all itself. Just as the cells of your own body work together to form a greater unity, a living being, so your body as a whole is like a single cell in the organism of the universe. Along with every atom in the universe, you necessarily contribute your role to the unfolding of its grand design. As your consciousness expands and your mind stretches out to reach the vastness of eternity, things change greatly in perspective and shifts occur in their relative importance. Trivial things seem trivial to you. Indifferent things seem indifferent. The significance of your own attitude toward life becomes more and more apparent. You realize that life is what you make of it. You learn to put things in perspective and focus on your true values and priorities in life. One stage at a time you develop the serenity to accept the things you cannot change, the courage to change the things you can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You follow nature, your own true nature as a rational, truth-seeking, thinking human being, and the one great nature of the universe as a whole. Now in a moment, you're going to begin sinking back down to earth, towards your place in the here and now. Part of you can always remain aware of the view from above though. Whenever you like, you can return to and remember that perspective and the feeling of serenity it brings. Now you begin your descent back down to earth to face the future with greater confidence and equanimity. You sink back down through the sky, down, 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 toward the local area, towards Toronto, and down, down into this building. Down, 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 you sink back, gently, into your body, all the way now. As your feet slowly come to rest upon the floor, once again. Now think about the room around you. Think about action, movement. Think about looking around and getting your orientation, raising your head a little. Begin to breathe a little bit more deeply, a little bit more energetically. Let your body feel more alive and ready for action. Breathe energy and vitality into your body. Breathe a little deeper and deeper again until you're ready to take a deep breath, open your eyes and emerge from the meditation, taking your mindfulness and self-awareness forward into life. So beginning now, taking a deeper breath and opening your eyes if you haven't already. And when you're ready, entering the here and now with deep calm and serenity. So that 
is the cosmic perspective of Stoicism. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe it's now lunchtime. Am I correct? That soothing uh, Scottish voice gets me uh, every time. <laughs>